Welcome to the Center of Light Radio with spiritual teacher, intuitive, musician, composer, and best-selling author of The Divine Principle, Anchoring Heaven on Earth, your host, Keith Anthony Blanchard. Coast to coast, pole to pole, all around the world on the internet, thanks to the marvel of technology, I'm coming at you live from my little bitty old guest house in Memphis, Tennessee. This is Keith Anthony Blanchard, and you're listening to Center of Light Radio, Center of Divine Unfoldment and Reinforcement. The superhighway to knowledge for that which is most important, and that would be you. You are important to me as to why I sit in this captain's chair every Monday night, 6 p.m. Eastern time. Power up, my brother and sister astronauts, as we launch for inner space. I have a fantastic guest tonight. I always look forward to having this gentleman on my show. We'll get to him shortly and uh, he's going to fill you full of really juicy spiritual tidbits. You can bet on that. Um, Some services I would like to announce that I I do perform if you're in in need of such uh, speaking. I've been doing speaking for many, many years, uh, giving life-changing presentations uh, about basic spirituality, about divine incarnations that have come to earth, those who are here now and uh, somewhat some who may be coming in the future, um, extraterrestrials. I mean, I can speak about many, many different topics, pe- helping people fulfill their passion, living in their dreams, beating their feet toward their bliss. Whatever it is you need, I can cater to your theme, that's for sure. I do spiritual readings as well as life coaching. But also, if you have some boogeymen in your house and you want them gone, some dark entities, Contact me, Keith Anthony Blanchard at gmail.com for any of these services, and I'd be glad to help you. So remember, if you have squatters in your house not paying rent and you want them gone, I have a bag of tricks that will help you raise the vibration of yourself, your home, your house, everything in it, and those bad beings in your house will disappear just as quick as they came because they will not be able to function in the vibration. You're, they will not actually be able to see you, nor would you be able to see them. Contact me if you need me for any of those services. Also, uh, if you go to centeroflightradio.com, look to the right bottom-hand side, you will see a subscription form. Fill it out. I'll be more than happy to send you my awesome power-packed newsletter. I put a lot of time into this newsletter. It's uh, a monthly newsletter. Um, I do a lot of work. Many hours go into finding the empowering secrets that I that I can call it, I guess, uh, things that expand my heart, things that expand my consciousness. And I, in turn, want to give you that for free. Cost you not a thing whatsoever. But also, while you are filling out that form, remember, you will have access to my lifelong work, RPM, recognize, plug in, and manifest your life. All of my life, all of my spiritual life has come down to this particular program. It's a once a month for a year. It's not to fix you because you're broken. It's about to help you find ways of expanding yourself so you can bathe in the bliss that you deserve, the bliss that you are at your essence, but also to be able to have the power, the tools, all of that stuff in the palm of your hand so you can begin to manifest your life, those things that you want. You want more money? I have the secret to do it. So I guess the question becomes, Keith, how was your financial life? My financial life is doing just fine. You want more spiritual bliss? I can help you ease into that very nicely. You want that red Ferrari car? It's all the same technique straight across the board. Apply one in your life. Apply this in the other aspect of your life. It's all the same idea. You may have to tweak a little bit here and there for each thing you are inviting into your life or opening yourself up to. But you can bet, uh, you know, it's a money back guarantee. There's nothing to lose. It's the RPM recognized plug in and manifest program. You will find that in the newsletter as well. Still waiting to hear from Swamji Viswayogi. God realized man from India. I had the blessed opportunity to speak with quite a few times. I'm looking forward to having him here back on Center of Light Radio. And the theme for this year is uh, healing the earth by purifying the waters. By purifying the waters. What an interesting, powerful, powerhouse, lighthouse this man is. Uh, and finally, before we get down to the show, because I'm, I'm very excited. I'm wringing my hands over here. 
while you're at Center of Light Radio, check out the Do What You Love Forever tab. In it, you get my The Divine Principle, Anchoring Heaven on Earth Bestseller, Self-Reflection Workbook, Divine Daily Supplements, Do What You Love, A Path to Passionate Living, uh, the movie about my life made by Blue Cast Productions out of New York. Very, very fine film. It empowers you yet again with more secrets, more tools of how you can begin to take on um, walking the walk towards your best life. You also get the Divine Principle audiobook multimedia music album. The music you hear at the intro of the show is my spiritual band recorded with members of the Memphis Symphony Orchestra. Lavender Soul is the name of the project. Uh, they're the soundtrack behind the audiobook. That in and of itself is a high figure value. And I'm giving you all this for five bucks. Why? Because I can, and it's all digital download. So it's yours for the taking. And all that long-winded stuff, I'm going to take a breath and invite God in <laughs> and invite my guest in. Let me tell you a little bit about my guest because now it's time to get down to Center Light Radio business. Today, my guest is Dr. John C. Robinson. John Robinson is a clinical psychologist with a second doctorate in ministry, an ordained interfaith minister, conference and workshop speaker, and the author of numerous articles, blogs, and nine books, nine books on the interface of psychology, spirituality, mysticism. I love mysticism. In the second half of life, a full-time writer now, John's interest has turned to the astonishing personal and collective transformations of the new aging. His latest book, the Divine Human, The Final Transformation of Sacred Aging is now available in ebook and paperback options. And I'm sure you can find this brilliant work at www.johnrobinson.org. Mr. John C. Robinson, my friend, my bro ham, welcome to Center of Light Radio once again. Hey, Keith, it's wonderful to be with you again. I always look forward to our time together. Yeah, we have a pretty good time, we don't do. we, sir? <laughs> uh, you and I were talking for a bit in the green room about how your book, your new one, The Divine Human, uh, parallels with my book, The Divine Principle, Anchoring Heaven on Earth. The, the names were pretty synonymous there. Yeah. If you would, give me an overview of what we can look forward to in this new masterpiece of yours, sir. Well, so the divine human is refers to someone who experiences himself literally as divine. It's a state of consciousness that's free of identity, time, and story, and free of the whole problem-ridden labyrinth of mind. And instead, what you find is in this experience is that your consciousness and being is actually the consciousness and being of God. So it's all about what that means, how to experience it, and how the world and yourself are transformed in the experience. Is this a how-to book, or is this a fictional story that puts all this together in a way that the reader would understand? No, no, this is a how-to book. It's a description of, of the psychology, spirituality, and mysticism of our transformation in this new era of spirituality. Uh, we, we were all born to be mystics, but more than that, we were all born divine, and then we forgot it. We lost it, and, the, and this overlay of, of belief systems and, and the left hemisphere it's completely hijacked consciousness, and we now don't believe that we're anywhere near God. We feel like we have to, you know, do some kind of exercises or practices and and we've forgotten that we are, in fact, the one and only. There is only one thing, and that is the divine, and we are that. This is a book that makes it very concrete. It's not just abstract. It's about how to feel it, how to experience it, and, and to how to feel the immense love and, and, and awakening that happened when you get in touch with these energies. Whenever you and I speak, sir, and we have these spiritual back-and-forth sessions, which I absolutely adore. Uh, somehow we end up talking about book covers. And I'm sitting here, I just put <laughs> it in the, the chat room, your new book cover. And let me see if I'm spot on again, because I hit it pretty good the last two times. I'm looking at your cover, and it's gorgeous. And I just see nothing but these gold flakes. Is that implying we're all stardust? We are, uh, what's the song from Woodstock? <laughs> We are all these gold metal flakes of the one particular gym, yeah? Yeah, yeah, you got it. 
It's lovely, lovely. How did you, uh, what inspired you to have this cover? Because it's a sea of, looks like a sea of individual souls for me, uh, yeah. who we are in our essence. You know, I, I don't really know how to answer that. I, I saw that among the options, and I, and I just said, wow, I mean, this is the, 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 our essential nature, the purity of our own divinity bursting through the darkness of our ignorance. And, I, and it just felt like, wow, I'm that light, and you are too, and let's, let's bring it into the world. I don't want to give too much of your book away. Well, one, I haven't read it, so I don't want you to do that. But if you would, can you give me us some insight into the mechanics of how the how to's of your book? Because you said this is a book about sure. information. So how would what would one expect to find in your book on uh, setting them on their walk towards becoming uh, a conscious divine human? Yeah. Well, so how do you get there? That's such a good question. The mystics. They all tell us throughout the eons of time and geography that the universe, the cosmos, is conscious and alive. It's everywhere saturated with the divine intelligence and presence. In other words, there's only one consciousness, and it's everywhere. Now, consciousness, therefore, is not just in us. It's not just in me. I am in it, and it is the consciousness of the divine. So what this means is that when you experience your own consciousness without an overlay of thought, just experiencing it purely and intensely, my gosh, you're experiencing God right there and then. And so the problem is how do we remove this this whole overlay of belief system. The left hemisphere has just been hijacked by, by the left hemisphere has hijacked consciousness. Uh, we, we've forgotten how to know God because we're so caught up in what we think about the divine. So we create books and, and beliefs and, and practices and theologies, but that's all mind. It's not God. You, the only way you can know God is to stop thinking heightened awareness, and become conscious of consciousness itself in a new way. When this happens, and when you realize that this direct experience of consciousness as the divine, as you, things begin to open up everywhere in your life. And then when you tune into your own physical being, bringing consciousness into being, well, then you just get the joy, bliss, love, and freedom that that people have been talking about forever. This is the awakened state that is not nearly as hard as people make it out to be. The thing is, you got to stop talking about it and start experiencing it. I'm excited about getting this book, my friend. Uh, Dana from the chat room uh, says she finished the, the lyric I couldn't find, and it's beautiful. We are stardust. We are golden. And I think the final lyric on that particular phrase of the song is, we are one billion year old carbon. <laughs> yeah. I, I love that entire era. Yeah. So now that we have a, an idea of how um, we can begin our walk towards divine consciousness. John, do you think that before we were born without, so we don't have to go outside and blame the system, those people who did all that to me or to us and that hijacked our consciousness, do you think we came down on this earth plane to somewhat forget sort of knowing how things were going to take place only to go through the dance of doing our darndest uh, to meander through the muck so we can become like the lo lotus petal that rises through the polluted water. Yeah, you know, I, I think that we, we are all, as yet very young children, we are very mystical. And, and in some sense, you know, heaven lies about us in, in our infancy, as, as, the, as the poets say. Uh, and then what happens is that the world of man with its belief systems and its education and its values and so forth closes down around us, and we lose that already existing connection. And so we've come into the world to be darkened so that we can bring light, but we have to find our way back to the light. It seems like so much of growing up and so much of, of our life as we age is, how do I find my way back to that original consciousness that, that I had when I came here so that I can bring it into the world and transform the world of man into a radiant place? I mean, that's really the whole, we're in a new evolutionary stage of spirituality. Everything now is happening in order to give birth to a bright new New radiant world, we must all participate in this. And we are either in the dark or we're in the light. And our goal then is to wake up so much that the light pours from us as love and people begin to change. And if, you know, if enough of us do that, we'll be, reach a tipping point and, and things will in fact change. Absolutely agree. You know, we, I'm going to hypothetically ask a question 
for others. You know, then if that's is all true and we're divine conscious at our essence, and but yet a part of us is still there, then why do we have to do all this stuff? I mean, well, that's because it's fun. I mean, <laughs> if, I mean, if we didn't want to do it this way, we could have just all just popped out and manifest these bodies on the earth plane. It would be said and done already. But that's not the gig. The gig is about the unfolding. Yes. Yeah, we're working on something here. It was just given to us that we wouldn't work on it. You know, everything we do that brings the light is like building more and more of this of this radiant consciousness that we share. So, so it's like we are all part of the of the infinite divine, moving along in in a process that transforms everything in its wake. I don't think any of us. Even our best spiritualists, myself, <laughs> I'm patting myself on the back, you, uh, any of the people who are spiritually endowed, um, have any idea. I mean, we can maybe glimpse, hope, pray, kind of squeeze an idea out here or there in our minds of how we think this is going to unfold and to what level of magnificence. But I think some years down the road, it's going to happen in such a way that there's just no way the juiciness that anyone would be able to ever foresee. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with you. I, I think that we are, everything you know blocks off the things you don't know. And if you really <laughs> believe something, what happens yes. is it just gets in your way. You know, so it's better not, not to think at all, but to, but to be as, as intensely present as possible, because then you are in the moment to mo- moment unfolding of it. You are it. Because you are conscious. Soon as you close down around an idea, you've shut yourself off from the process. That's a great irony. Even if you're thinking about the best and most truest, you know, spiritual ideas, once you start thinking about them, you've shut yourself off from the divine. Yeah, because we begin to insert our own ideas versus yeah. remaining open for ideas that or not in our field of, quote, vision, because uh, our ideas would cloud that. So, John, do you see your books written in a particular chronological order? Because your last book, Breakthrough, um, seems like it was divine design. <laughs> yeah. And that brought you to this place. One, I have a, something, an obstacle, so I need to go break through. And now that someone has broken through, at least from the, the perspective of you writing these books, now you're at the level of walking through the th- threshold of divine human. You're, you're exactly right. Yeah. So the, the whole series of books has been my journey from from getting it conceptually and, and from and hearing it from the mystics, so I, I really understood. Oh my God, that is what what they're talking about, and and it helped me remember my early childhood when I had the same experience. But then it was then how do I get back to it? And the, all the books were a singular journey uh, to understand the mechanics of the personality and and its psychological spiritual basis to understand it, so I could see how you open the door. And once you open the door and begin to step through, then then it, it quickens and you begin to feel the, the joy of the radiant world as being right here. Yeah, then, I'm glad you brought that up. How do you open the door? How do you do it? Someone say, well, can't you just tell me? Well, yeah, I, I can tell you all day long. I can, I can only show you the door. The door can only be shown. Everybody's light switch is located in a very different place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. From, yeah from the it's check. about, ahead, it's John, about stopping thinking. You know, the thought world is really helpful if you want to get from here to Tennessee, but it's not very help for, helpful for knowing God because the thoughts, well, it's, like a, it's like the windshield in your car. Every thought is like a bug that smacks up against it, you know, so <laughs> after you've driven so many miles, you can hardly see anything. You've got to clean the windshield, get, or in fact, you've got to get out of the car and experience things directly <laughs> to really know them. From the chat room, Don Danny asks a question. He says, "Do you have trouble? Ex- do you have trouble explaining Carl Jung's mistaken term, collective unconsciousness, because conscious choice seems to be the only thing that can affect our realities?" Well, well, the collective unconscious re- really is this vast unknown sea of archetypes and energies and so forth that that 
is underneath everybody. It's like raw floating on the surface of water, and this is what's underneath it, giving rise to things. But you're right. You The job of, of spiritual growth is to make things conscious. So the more you can, you can become conscious of your shadow, the more that you can become conscious of these other forces, the more they become part of the world that the human beings have access to. John, define consciousness. <laughs> we, we I'm know, sorry. Consciousness, <laughs> I, I believe consciousness is an irre, irreducible quality of the cosmos. It's basically God. And you cannot reduce it to any other concepts or terms or whatever without distorting the your perception of it. You can try to say, oh, it's in the right hemisphere or always oh, has to do with certain brain structures and so forth. And that's just... You know, that's just more language on top of more language. If it, it's it's a, it is an unchangeable, eternal quality of the universe to be awake and aware, and that's and that's all you can really say about it. And we share in that awake and awareness, which is what's so amazing, and that's what makes us divine humans. And because it can't be reduced down to anything explainable, that would be zero. And zero has divine attributes like union wholeness, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that zero is not a number, it's a concept, but that in and of itself is very limiting because we try to, in fact, as long as we try to understand that concept, uh, it will remain just a concept versus something that's experiential. Right. The more you try to understand any, you know, understanding is good up to a point, and then whatever your theory or theology is, it needs to point beyond itself into a space of unknowing but intensely aware unknowing so that you can open to the divine. Have you heard of the idea that one should, could focus on a fixed object during a meditation because being focused on that fixed object helps the mind escape to the infinity? There's a million ways to do meditation, and that's as good as any. Uh, what I like about the fixed object business is that the more intensely you look at anything, like a pencil or a rock or anything, and you look at it and you stare at it with with uh, intense awareness, the more it begins to change in front of your eyes. It begins to be brighter and more beautiful and more holy, and, and you begin to realize that you're looking into the divine world that you hadn't noticed before. Yes, yes, yes. It begins to melt. At least our ideas of what we're trying to force into the object begins to dissipate. Because, for example, if you say the word apple um, 10, 12, 15, 20 times, it begins to lose its its meaning. Because meaningless. Yeah. It's just 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 another at that point. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and we, this is the way we treat the world. We walk down the street, and we and we see a tree, and we say tree, and we move on. You know, we see car and car. We never see anything. We see our our mental constructs of those things. So what what's happened is that we're really trapped in the in the matrix of our own left hemisphere, and and you cannot get out of that trap, out of that labyrinth until you stop thinking and wake up. Then you wake up to what the world is right in front of you, and then when you touch the tree and feel the sun's warmth on it and then smell the bark and, and get it and become one with it in your consciousness, oh my God, like fireworks go off. I'm wondering this is what happened if this is what happened to the Buddha when he, he made a declaration. You know, he's been out in the wilderness for a very long time. Mm-hmm. He sat under the Bodhi tree and he said, I will not leave from under this tree until I become enlightened. And the next morning he woke up. Well, he, the next morning he saw the sun rise and he became enlightened. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> and the first thing he did was have a, an orange and some water. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the yeah, way. yeah, he had a declaration. He had himself. an intention that he was not going to move. And that kind of space will make mountains move. I totally agree yeah. because that's how it all started for me. I had one asking that I asked it for a month. In my first asking was my heart. It was my passion. It was my sincerity. And uh, I became, quote, enlightened just like uh, the Buddha did under that tree. So I agree that the idea that when we bring such depth of ourself into a situation, it, it will part the Red Sea. Yeah, and, and you know, the Buddha also said, we are what we think. All that we are arises with our thoughts. With our thoughts, we make the world. So what happens is that early on, we make this 
this separate world of mind. And, and that's, what, that, that's what he was waking up from, was that that's not who I am. And who you think you are is, is a fiction that has you trapped for a lifetime until you realize that you don't exist. I mean, you don't exist as the idea that you think you are. You exist as a consciousness that is brilliant and a light that is forming. And so, so I think all of the great teachers had these kind of experiences with light, where, where suddenly they got enlightened to <laughs> out of the mind and into the world of beauty. John, last time you and I spoke, or it could have been the time before, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but in short, I had this mystical experience. I was standing before the Godhead. I was invited in. Yes. And I wanted it so bad. I, I mean, I wanted it. But I chose not to, not out of fear of dying physically, but fear of dying my identity of everything I know dying and melting into the cosmic consciousness. Uh, uh, yes. So I, I, you know, and I sometimes think that it would be a little tougher for someone to die identity-wise than it would be actually physically-wise. But you see, this is what aging is. It's the death of who you thought you were. I mean, everything that you, you leave your career and you leave all that stuff behind and, and you think you're still a whatever and you're not. It's all just memory and, if, and memory and thought and fantasy and so forth. And when you stop thinking, it all goes away. Now, that's terrifying, but that's also the, the nature of all transformation. It's like when you get divorced, you have to give up all this stuff to make room for some brand new possibility. And, and we die before we die if we're really conscious because we've got to let go of all that baggage from our life so that as we reach the end, we are open to the possibilities of crossing over in, in a way that just doesn't lock us into the same mind forms. I mean, Buddhists, for example, don't want to take uh, pain meds when, you know, at the time of death because they don't want their consciousness clouded. Yes, yes. And it's, it's said that one should be as conscious as possible in the transition of death. Ironically, right. the greatest yeah. transition in life is death. That's where we're going, and that's the biggest <laughs> thing of all. And, and the idea that we should prepare for it is, is, seems obvious to me. John, are you excited about your um, new journey to the other side? You know, I, I am. I, among the friends that I can really talk to about this, because not everybody wants to talk about these things, <laughs> you know, is this kind of excitement of like, yeah, you know, every, is everything we've learned so far is the next thing's even more amazing. And this one will be too. But I think what we've learned also is that you bring with you your stuff. And on the other side, you're going to, if you're really a bad guy, you're going to end up in a bad place because that's not, it's not so much punishment. It's, it's the energies that you carry and you're drawn to. So the more we can cleanse ourselves of all this, this um, you know, of the junk we carry that obscures consciousness, the more our consciousness will meld with the one, and then we will give birth to something, a new iteration of ourselves that's going to be kind of amazing. I think the, the opportunities in the next world are going to go on uh, in the most exciting ways. I often, I, I often entertain the idea of my passing, and uh, I have that place inside that's a little fearful of it, not nervous of the mm -hmm. actual transition of being there. Yeah, I want, if, I, if, I could, if I didn't have my 11-year-old boy, yeah. I would probably be really open to the idea, have a big party for about a month, uh, strap in my seatbelt, and I would probably just volunteer for the ride, right? Yeah. Uh, but when I contemplate the idea, I'm really careful about what kind of energies I'm putting out there, just to be the responsible guy for that little boy's sake. Sure. But I, I've often said, in fact, I said in an interview recently that heaven and hell are not locations. Heaven is your best life with or without a body. Hell is your life screwed up no matter what yeah. plane of existence yeah, your you're Your state of mind as much as anything, yeah. And, and you know, people who have near-death experiences that get called back is because their work is not done yet. So you don't, you don't want to leave too soon, like with your son, because you're still there for him. You've got a really, really important job yet to do. And yet I'm here I am at 70. I'm I'm in a place where everybody's going to get along fine without me and and they will miss me but I think this is I mean you know the next 10 years 70 to 80 are, are big years for things to change and decline and 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 that's okay that's the way it works if we can if we can surrender to it's you res, it's resistance that causes pain if you can surrender to the river of life then the joy will bring you to the next place 
Do you think that's part of, quote, the problem for some as to why they are not interested in the idea of their mortality because they may be forgotten? Yeah, I think so. I mean, no, it's, it's a process of, of aging that asks us to surrender all these things. And if you haven't worked on yourself during your life, if you haven't worked spiritually and psychologically, then when you get to the end, it's terrifying, the idea of losing yourself. And, and we know that you don't get wise just by being old. You've got to do this inner work of aging. But when you do it, suddenly the, the, the vista opens up again and you realize, well, I don't need to be this guy that I always thought I was. I'm the whole thing. You know, I'm this tree, I'm the sky, I'm the love that fills the world, I, I am the voice that pours through all of us. You begin to wax eloquent into this oneness state that is so full of joy and love that, that you know, you're just dancing on tabletops. Keith Anthony Blanchard here, your host of Center of Light Radio, Monday night, 6 p.m. Eastern Time. My guest tonight is Mr. John Robinson. We're talking about his brand new book, The Divine Human. John, would you tell our listening audience how they can find out more about you and your marvelous work, sir? Oh, thank you. Yes, come to my website, which is www.johnjohnrobinson.org, johnrobinson.org, and you'll see all the books, and you'll see a blog, and you'll you'll see all all sorts of links and and previous talks and videos and so forth. So, if you want to understand this. Come to my website and let's get, and you can also ask me questions. I'm happy to answer questions by email. So, John, we talked about the intro to the book and how the fact that it's a how to. Uh, can you give me an overview of what they're going to find in the middle of the book? What stage would they be at in the learning curve of it all? Well, I think everybody starts kind of at the beginning, unless you have an intuition about what this process is. So the very beginning has a lot to do with the, the theory of all of this, you know, like how are religions really formed and, and what is the mystical experience and, and what how does it change people? And then we begin to dive right into some really transformational realizations, such as all consciousness is God's consciousness. All being is God's being. And when you merge consciousness and being in your own experience, you are literally incarnating the divine and the joy that you feel. And, and that experience will, is like proof that, that you are transmuting your very being. You're becoming that which is divine simply by experiencing it. These things are just words as I'm talking, but as we go through the book, I mean, I give you lots of examples and I lots of exercises to in order to do this yourself. And then we get to learn stuff like, well, how can you have a, have a more active relationship with this with this divine universe that we're in. And so I teach principles of how to dialogue with the divine or how to ask ultimate questions in such a way that you get answers to your ultimate questions. The answers are in you because you are made of God. And so when you begin to open yourself and ask them in a certain way, my God, the stuff just flows up out of you. And in a way, you become you become a mystic. And then what's really more amazing is that if you really spend time in this state of consciousness, the mystic becomes the prophet, meaning that you begin to realize the things that need to happen in the world for it to grow, for it to change. And so, you know, that, that's why as we get older and we, and we search for something meaningful to do with our lives, you know, we're not just out there, you know, sweating for the buck, but wanting to give back to society, you begin to realize that, that from your own divine being flows a self that has so much to give, and which is why it's incredibly important to use principles of discernment to find out, well, who are you really, so you'll find out what your gifts are for the world. It's aging is this opportunity to love that is, uh, you, know, uh, you know, unparalleled to anything else. I loved your description about the middle of your book. Um, knowing you for the time I have and speaking directly to you the times I have, uh, intuiting you and feeling you and knowing the, the good man you are. I, I, in fact, I've told uh, a, lot of, a lot of people today how much I enjoy our conversation because yeah, you're a very, very likable guy. And that being said, um, as you explain the middle of your book, it's not a sales pitch when John, trust me, listening audience, when John says, you know, I can 
show you through this book how you can converse with the divine yourself. That is not a sales pitch to buy books. It's not. <laughs> Trust well, me. I'm not. I, I think that's the very best part so far that you've described that will pull people to want to read your book because who does not want to make a connection to the divine source of which we're all a part that some people might have trouble. And so I definitely support the idea of this book and you can bet I'm going to order it. But the fact that most people would like to have cosmic, divine, infinite guidance. And I'm really, really happy that you have this particular place in your book for empowering people to be able to do just that, John. Great job. Good. Thank you. And and thank you for, for your immense work on spirituality and spiritual unfoldment. So, I mean, we're all, we're, we're all in this together, which is what's so beautiful about life. And we resonate off each other so that, you know, we're like all like popcorn kernels all around the world popping into new states of consciousness. <laughs> like stardust. <laughs> like stardust. Yeah, we'll be singing next. John, it's been a while since you and I spoke. Didn't you share with me in a previous interview that you passed to the other side briefly. Is that true? Do I, am I remembering correctly? You're, you're, you're almost remembering correctly. I had a, I had a, a, um, a open heart surgery when I was a child that, that where I literally woke up in surgery and found hands working inside my heart. And it, and I, you know, repressed the whole thing as a 14 year old boy because it was too hor horrifying. And 40 years to the month later, when I was being defibrillated for an atrial fibrillation uh, experience, you know, it all came back. So it really was, I mean, it was, a, it was an experience of like a living autopsy. I mean, I was paralyzed. I was cold. I was in the dark. My eyes were taped. I could not communicate. And yet I could feel what was going on. And so that experience has, you know, ended my career. But it also shaped an understanding that I, I, it was an initiation for me as a boy that was never finished. You know, but teenagers need to be initiated in, in a sacred way. So it took me to come back in touch with this experience at the age of 55 to, to uh, understand that it was a shamanic initiation opening my soul uh, in a way that had never been opened before. I had, in effect, I had died and been reborn. When you said you can feel them working on you, was it was were you numb and you can just feel that something was going on, or, or could you actually feel? Was there pain involved? Is what I'm asking. Because if there was, it had to be immense. Yeah, you know, fortunately, uh, there was no pain. The, the anesthesia awareness experience, which is what this is called, can vary from no pain to extreme pain. Fortunately, there wasn't pain, but there was horror. That, that, you know, what is going on here? And I could feel, you know, movement and jerking and pulling and tearing and, and cutting and so forth. So it was like I could feel myself being taken apart, opened up and spread out. just like, like you know, like a fish. But, and then sewed back up together again. But it, it was never over it because I had never felt it. I had to work through that emotional pain and then understand the, the spiritual symbolism of it all before it would be completed. You knew going into it, this was going to take place. You knew on the out of it that this is what has taken place. But when you were in it, did you have the awareness of, oh, wow, that's right. This is no. what they are doing. Or yeah. was that something completely different? You don't get insights at the time very much. You get them looking back. You know, we can all look at, <laughs> at traumas in our life. And at the time, it was just craziness and, and pain and struggle. And, and then 30 years later, you look back on it and you say, wow, that was one of the most important experiences in my life. And now I know why I needed it. So, yeah, it's it's uh you don't, you don't know right away. You just have to have blind faith that it's worth going through whatever you have to go through. Wow. I'm just trying to wrap my mind around the experience of being in that experience and just trying to make sense of the sensations that is so yeah. weird and the state of consciousness that has to be very somewhat what, aloof and dreamy. And that's... <laughs> yeah. It's, it's horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> right. A nightmare you can't come out of like sleep paralysis. Yeah, yeah. But you do. I mean, it's like a nightmare, a literal nightmare at night. Jeremy Taylor says the, even the worst dreams we ever have are also telling us that we're capable of dealing with the material that's now coming up or we wouldn't have the dream. So even the awful living nightmares we go through are opportunities to to grow 
in our understanding of evil or of of pain or of the, just the nature of transformation, we are being transformed in the moment. Yeah, it hurts, but it's like everything else. It's, it's turning into something altogether new. And that's the nature of the whole cosmos. John, what changing. would be your definition of evil? Of what? Your of definition evil? of evil. You know, evil, I think, is, is well, at one level, is, is using other people for, for your own, you know, for, for your own selfish gains. Other people are animals or sentient beings. But it's, it's obviously a, a, an area of immense ignorance. In other words, that you could do stuff like people are doing in, in, in Syria or, or in, you know, in, in the wars around the world or in child trafficking is unbelievably horrible. And, and there's a question of how, how can you ever, how can this even be happening? How can men act like this? Yeah. You know, and, and it's you have to stand in the fire with that person to really get what's going on. And it takes a lot out of you to do that. And it will take us a long time to raise those people into consciousness. Sure. And it, and it, the other part of that equation is, you know, we hear a lot of spiritual teachers saying, you know, this is all just a divine play and God's running all of it. That being said, you know, it's kind of split that people yeah. are responsible, but yet they are not. So, and you know, it's hard. I never imagined, you know, growing up, even when I began my spiritual walk and becoming somewhat conscious of my own consciousness, I knew some of the atrocities, some of the horrible crap that happens in the world done by other people and some of the evils that they do. But being uh, an explorer as I am, when I find something, I really chase it into the rabbit hole as far as I possibly can. Some of these horrific things are, that these people are doing are so far beyond my scope of even understanding that such things could even be possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yet, you know, we all have shadows. We all have dark sides. In our lives, we have all used people, maybe not as as awfully as that, but still have, having done that in various ways. Uh, you know, this is a process that um, the only way to understand it is to somehow identify with it or to, or to be, uh, have empathy in it, to resonate with it, to see why this is happening or what it is that's happening. And, you know, it's like consciousness is like a big television set. You know, you can turn it on the channel of the yeah. Buddha and say it's all just, you know, stuff, the, the play of Leela, you know, in, in, in the world. And you turn it on the next channel and it's like the most horrifying thing you could ever imagine. And then you go on to another one. And these are that's all that we, the, the human consciousness is just so limited still in integrating all of these opposites and, and um you know, and irreconcilables. It, it it just doesn't know how to do it yet. And, and in fact, but it is the one thing happening. And we just misunderstand. It is we that make the world ugly. I like the way you use the TV analogy. And I've always said that what helped me to have some relief around the idea of all the bad, horrible things that people in the seat of power can do and are doing um, is to realize that it's not about this life it's bigger than that it's way yes bigger yeah, than yeah, that. And yeah, everyone yeah. is on their christ consciousness path and yeah. who's to say what it takes for that person to have soul evolution no one knows why someone gets sick and die no one knows why this little child was whatever that the most horrific mm -hmm. event you can mm -hmm. imagine in your mind has happened but it very well could be through such said experience that because of when the child or the soul of whatever person passes that they have this explosion this amazing epiphany from something that's been lagging something that's been needing to happen for so many lifetimes for them to get the final aha of it all yeah yeah i think that's why it's important to not draw hard and close conclusions about things there are how many lifetimes before this one how have we been working on how many more do we have to go you know, what other dimensions of existence, what other beings, what other conscious, sentient beings are involved in our life that we're not aware of? It's much bigger than we can possibly know. So all we can do is to stay present and, and open the heart to what is and, and, and see what comes next.
John, what can we look forward to in your book, The Divine Human? Towards the end of the book, how do you put the bow in this package, sir? Well, I, I, I want a, a couple things. I talk about, you know, how is it that that individual consciousness is basically replicates the cosmic consciousness and how, you know, they're the microcosm, macrocosm thing. And that, you know, th- this whole thing, this whole 13.8 billion year old conscious being that has exploded into its... It, you know, the, the Hindus say this happens so many, every so many, every yurga, this happens again. These ages come and go and come and go. But for us, there is this great thing unfolding. And then, and and we, it is basically mirrors our own, un, own unfoldment and we are part of it. So we are part of the, the divine creating the the cosmos and everything that we do and feel and be is part of this creation experience. And so if you're in your true self, meaning that you really let the energies of your natural being live you, you are being part of the of creation taking place. And that that is that is, you know, your job in the in the world is to wait to allow yourself to be used by the creation to create more and more of this marvelous thing that's going on here. And so then at the very end, I think I want to get into um, what it, what does it mean to say that, well, what, what is the power of love all about? Because I came to understand that love itself is is basically consciousness, is a power that that is infinite, goes to the every far reaches of the universe. So if you touch, if you touch one thing, you're touching the whole. And if you love one thing, you're loving the whole. And so you have much more power than you think in the world. We always feel so helpless about changing things. But if we realize that we are, our consciousness is one with the Im- the immensity of the, of the cosmos, and it's certainly every place on Earth, and the loving thoughts we send out and the way we embrace the world actually makes a difference and actually is worth doing, and, and that we are not helpless victims in this process. And then at the end, it's like, well, so what does it mean to say I am God? It certainly doesn't mean that, that you are God and nobody else is, because that would be colossal you know, arrogance, but it means that if you get rid of the false self, of course— and so are you, you know, and so is this tree. And how wonderful is that? That's what it, that's the kind of conclusion. You know, I've, I've had people, John, say to claim that you are God by saying I am God is, like you said, colossal arrogance. I don't see it that way at all. I see it as an affirmation that reminds me of my obligation, my duty and my responsibility as an awakened individual on this planet. Well, sure. Okay. I, I, the the risk is only that other people may take it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, of, of I course. Disagree, I don't disagree with the, the sentiment at all. I, I think that it depends on the place that you come from, if you ever utter such words. For example, yeah. you, you know, just even in a post or even in a book that you may have written, that not that you would go around in your daily life and say, hey, everyone, you know, <laughs> I, I'm the divine, okay? Yeah. <laughs> right. So, John, I, I take it that um, being um, the spiritual teacher that you are and an author of nine books um, and doing the intensive and extensive work that you have on yourself and the life that you have unfolded for you, that it's common for you to dabble, no, that's not the right word, to play in the field of such divine consciousness often. And oh, if you yes. would, would you describe to our listening audience, what it's like to be you in that experience with the hopes that it might motivate them and pull them more into themselves to want to have the same experience. Oh my gosh. The most exa- simple example for me is when I, I, every day I take a walk down to the end of the island and out on the spit and back around and come home again. And, and in this state of mystical consciousness, I, I, there is no place to go and nothing to figure out. And there's this sense of just incredible wonder at i mean i i'm 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 arrested over and over again by the perception of that weed and the way that wind blows through my hair and the sunshine on my face and i I, i'm stopping all the time to to be grateful that i am this thing that we all are and uh, so so that the the wind is the music and and my body is the symphony and you know it's like i lose myself completely into this flowing experience of unity uh i don't think there's anything better than that and what and coming back from that 
you know, there's a way in which everything that I had been thinking about is now history, you know, just gone. And there's a wide open consciousness and and just this gr- grateful love that we are in this experience the way it is. And, and I just wish I could bring people with me or I could put it in my head as we take this walk, because so much of the grief of the world would fall away if we only knew who we really are and where we really are. You know, we live because we're trapped in this in this matrix of of horror and and grim belief systems and dog eat dog mentalities. We have no idea that we're living in Eden. The, you know, the heaven on earth is not left; it's always here. We make the world into a dark place and then suffer from it, and it's, we don't need to. And that was never the intention. John, as you just described wonderfully about your walk, feeling the breeze in your hair. Yeah. Um, this is all it takes to shift your consciousness, correct, sir? Yeah, sensations, simple these, sensations. these little bitty things. And yeah. so would you invite, agree, support the idea that maybe for the listening audience, if you're not at such a level in your development, the idea that you would just at least for the moment appreciate the breeze, appreciate the chair you're sitting on, just live in that appreciation. Yeah. And over time, as you work out any muscle group in your body, it will begin to expand and you will fall deeper and deeper into that level of appreciation. And therefore, the bliss and the divine feelings and the divine ideas and all that stuff begins to happen through such practice. Yes? Yes. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, and I would add uh, another thing. There's something called a Native American medicine walk. And basically what it boils down to is take yourself out by yourself out to the wilderness for a full day, you know, for eight or nine hours. Maybe bring some lunch. Be alone and just walk off for a while so you get away from everybody and everything and stay out there for eight or nine hours. And something will happen to you. That you, you'll find that your thoughts slow down, that, that the presence of the, of the wilderness will change you because it's, so, there's, it's the machine world that separates us and the people world that separates us from the divine. So that when, the, when we're out there in this beautiful, you know, living space of, of nature, you will come back a different person. Yeah, we're not distracted. We're left with our self. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's a vision quest in one day. John, what's on the horizon for you, sir, with this wonderful book you're going to be traveling about? Yeah, I've been doing a lot of conscious aging conferences, speaking about, you know, how to find your way of giving back or, or the three secrets of aging or those kinds of things. So I'm going to do that a little bit longer uh, because because aging people, at least the ones who go to these conferences, are very motivated to 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 wake up in this last stage of life and 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 find a way to to live it unlike any other time in their life. So I, they're very rewarding people to talk to, very exciting. And then after that, I don't know. I don't, I don't plan very far. I got six, seven grandchildren, one on the way, you know, so I, gaggle. that's enough for me. You have a gaggle. I got a gaggle of geese. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, do you think you can, man, I'd love it if you made it out to the Mid-South. So I'm assuming that you have a lot of blue-haired people there. But what about some of the youngsters? How was your attendance on the younger side of um, your, your audiences there? Yeah, well, I'm going to be doing a festival in the spring for the Center for, Christ- Center for Progressive Christianity, which is, you know, the millennials, they don't have conferences, they have festivals, you know, and they are much more kind of spontaneous. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. There was a survey recently that said that millennials really do, young people really do want mentoring from old people, but their complaint is that old people talk too much. And I know they're right. You know, we, we older people, if they really care about supporting the young, just they need to listen. And that's I'm looking forward to this a chance to just hang with people and just be present for them. John, sadly, it's amazing. I love the idea that God is eternal because on this show, when I have a guest like you, sir, time fleets. <laughs> Where did it go? <laughs> it just God, it's almost over. over. I can't believe you know, it. I was I watched a, a, a recent interview uh, with Sadhguru, and he said, you know, he was an, an inspiring yogi, and when it happened for him, he was sitting there for thirteen days, and to him, it was like you know a matter of like forty minutes. Yeah. And night after night had passed. Um, would you uh, leave our listening audience first with your contact information once again and a final thought um, that? 
might help our listening audience take into their lives, implement, and begin to see some amazing results in their life? Okay, so my contact information is uh, www.johnrobinson.org. You can find everything you need to know about my work there, and you can make contact with me. Uh, final ideas. Let me let me quote from the mystics, because I've always been following mystic teachers, and because they have so much to say. So here are a couple of them. So even our old friend Walt Whitman says, Divine am I inside and out, and I make holy whatever I touch or am touched from. And, and then uh, Thomas Merton says, our external superficial self is not eternal, not spiritual, far from it. This self is doomed to disappear as completely as smoke from a chimney. So it is with one who has vanished into God by pure contemplation. God alone is left. He is the one who acts there. He is the one who loves and knows and rejoices. That's what happens when the false self goes. And then Alan Watts summarizes it up. He says, at any rate, the point is that God is what nobody admits to being and everybody really is. Thank you. I'm just taking all that in, brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the book. You'll find it in the book. So John, do you um, have experiences at night when you sleep and you lose body consciousness? Do you go into those different spiritual dimensions and have any of these juicy, uh, oh, these juicy experiences? I, I do often. How about I, yourself? I know sir? you do. Yeah, you should. You, we should have. Uh, uh, I should interview you. We should meet on some, some point somewhere. <laughs> yes. look, if you're good at getting out of your body, come yank me out and take me to some of these far out places you <laughs> go, bro. Find you. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll take a trip. John, I appreciate you. You are such a delightful man and a wonderful guest here on Center of Light Radio, and you are Thank always you. welcome here, my friend. Wonderful. Ditto. And I'm, it's good being friends with you. I'll be chatting with you soon, everyone. Mr. John C. Robinson. I love this gentleman. I love his way. Uh, he teaches me a lot. He opens me up effortlessly every time uh, I'm blessed to interview this guy. Thank you very much, everyone. Chat room, thank you very much. I appreciate your return presence here over and over every Monday night, 6 p.m. Eastern Time when Center of Light Radio fires off. Next week on Center of Light Radio, another favorite of mine. They're all favorites of mine. What am I talking about? Mr. David Matthew Brown, and we're going to be speaking about falling down and rising. Uh, you're going to like David. He's he's really, really on his game. Really, really fun cat. Very knowledgeable. Very heart-centered individual. I'm going to see you guys next week. I'm off to play some loud, repulsive rock and roll. You can bet on that. Every Monday night, I am your host, Keith Anthony Blanchard. I sit here in this captain's chair and direct all the affairs of the heart. When you lay down at me and you have nothing to do, like John would say, just let it all go. Disappear into the cosmic sea of nothing really but as you're falling into that nothingness state an intention that you want to become conscious of that nothingness so you can find yourself the real somethingness within all of that breathe yourself into that space breathe over and over deliberately and soon you will find yourself quote on the other side on the inside the real place to be peace love and life I bid you all a good evening. Have a wonderful night.